Hi guys. Well, while most of the country apparently is in a deep freeze here in the Point Lonesome Swamp, it is a warm, windy spring day. We have arrived to Sunday, February 14th. 2021 so uh, I was going to uh, do a methane bomb rant uh, from this article in sciencealerts.com titled terrifying study finds melting permafrost could unleash way more carbon than we thought trapped within the Arctic permafrost there is a whole lot of carbon potentially up to four times more carbon than the combined amount of CO2 modern humans have emitted. It is one of the reasons scientists are so worried about the Arctic melting. As the ice goes, this carbon will be released. But now, a new study has shown that a melting Arctic may actually unleash far more carbon than even our worst case models have predicted. Do you think so? So I could uh, just go off on a methane bomb rant, and I was all set to do that until I remembered it. Hey, it is Sunday, and you're supposed to be doing your newly revived and revised Doomsday Sermon, and uh, where I... This year I am reading fiction about Doomsday, and so I touched on this book of short stories by writer T.C. Boyle, that's spelled B-O-Y-L-E, called Tooth and Claw last week, but we're going to read maybe about half of this article called Blinded by the Light. Because you know, I've often wondered what I sound like and what doomers sound like to normies. And uh, this is probably the best story I've ever found on the subject of why doomers are perhaps the most despised human beings on the planet. And... Uh, I honestly don't know. T.C. Boyle is not a clueless moron. Whether he's a doomer or not, I don't know. So this story, not sure when it was written, uh, before the methane bomb was discovered, but this was talking about the ozone hole. He just took the ozone hole as one example. It's going to be a little bit broken up because I'm going to be jumping around, but uh, let's hear from T.C. Boyle, blinded by the light. <clears throat> So, the sky is falling, or to be more precise, the sky is emitting poisonous rays, rays that have sprinkled the stigmata of skin cancer across both of Manuel Boncadano's cheeks and the tip of his nose, and sprouted the cataracts in Slobodan Abarca's roomy old eyes. That is what the tireless Mr. John Longworth of Long Beach, California, USA, would have us believe. I have been to Long Beach, California on two occasions, and I give no credence whatsoever to a man who would consciously assent to live in a place like that. He is, in fact, just what my neighbors say he is, an alarmist like that chicken in the children's tale who thinks the sky is falling just because something hit him on the head, on his head, on his individual and prejudicial head. And so the barnyard goes into a panic. And to what end? Nothing. A big, fat zero. And there begins the tale of uh, Mr. John Longworth Doomer and all of this poor family having to uh, put up with his doom and gloom. And so again, guys, I, I, I'm jumping ahead. I do encourage you to find this book and read this uh, story yourself. Um, so anyway, 
he ends up uh, at this at, at a party being cornered by this guy at one of his neighbors throwing this party and he's cornered by this doomer <clears throat> There was, as I soon discovered, to be one topic of conversation and only one topic throughout the meal, indeed throughout the entire three days of the fiesta, whenever and wherever Mr. John Longworth was able to insinuate himself and he seemed to have an almost supernatural ability to appear everywhere at once, as ubiquitous as a cockroach. And what was this penetrating and all-devouring topic? The sky, or rather the hole he perceived in the sky over Tierra del Fuego and the Antarctic a hole that would admit all the poisons of the universe and ultimately lead to the destruction of man and nature. He talked of algae and krill, of acid rain and carbon dioxide and storms that would sweep the earth with a fury unknown since creation. I took him for an enthusiast at best but deep down I wondered what asylum he had escaped from and when they would be coming to reclaim him. Now, there, this takes place uh, in a sheep ranch in Tierra del Fuego is where this is going on. He began over the, seat, over the soup course addressing the table at large as if he were standing at a podium and interrupting Don Pablo and me in a reminiscence of a salmon fishing excursion undertaken in our youth. None of you, he said, battering us with his consonants, especially someone with such fair skin as Paloma here, or Senora Antofagasta, should have that should leave the house this time of year without the maximum of protection. We're talking ultraviolet B radiation that increases by as much as one thousand percent over Punta Arenas in the spring because of the hole in the ozone layer." Close quote. And uh, they go on with this conversation um, for a while, and so the host is getting, uh, getting very irritated and says, well, what am I supposed to do? Just make everyone in the family wear sunglasses 24 hours a day. Quote, if you don't want to see them go blind, he retorted without pausing to draw a breath. The thought, as we say, brought my kettle to a boil. Who was this insufferable per person with his stabbing nose and deformed head to lecture us? And on what authority? I'm sorry, senor, I said, but I have heard some far-fetched pronouncements of doom in my time, and this one takes the cake. Millenarian hysteria is what I say it is. Proof, sir. What proof do you offer? I realized immediately that I had made a serious miscalculation. I could see it in the man's pale, leaping eyes, and the way his brow contracted, and that ponderous instrument of his nose began to sniff at the air as if he were a bloodhound off after a scent. For the next hour and a half, or until I retreated to my room begging indigestion, I was carpet bombed with statistics, chemical analyses, papers, studies, obscure terms, and obscure text until all I could think was that the end of the planet would be a relief if only because it would put an end to this incessant, nagging, pontificating, consonant-battering voice of the first-class bore across the table from me. At the time, I could not foresee what was coming, 
Though, if I had had my wits about me, it would have been a different story. Then I could have made plans, could have arranged to be in Paris, Rio, or Long Beach. Could have been in the hospital, for that matter, having my trick knee repaired after all these years. Anything, even dental work, would have been preferable to what fell out. Yes, and so then what happens is his neighbor uh, gets sick, so sick and tired of him, he pawns this guy off on the narrator of the story. So now the narrator of the story is stuck with this doomer in his, uh, in, in his, in his own house. Uh, again, I have to, uh, I, I, I have to skip ahead. So anyway, the guy starts out around the, the dinner table uh, talking about a basketball. Um, but I knew that it was only a matter of time before he switched from the esoterica of an obscure and, I am sure, tedious game to his one and true subject. After all, what sense was there in discussing a mere sport when the sky itself was corrupted? I did not have long to wait. There was a pause just after my son had, it, had expressed his exact agreement with something John Longworth had said regarding the three-point shot, whatever that might be, and John Longworth took advantage of the cessation to abruptly change the subject. Quote, I found an entire population of blind rabbits on Don Pablo's ranch, he said, apropos of nothing and without visibly pausing to chew or swallow. I shifted uneasily in my chair. Setafina crept noiselessly into the room to clear away the plates and serve dessert. <clears throat> Paloma, his daughter, was the first to respond, and at that and at the time I thought she was goading him on, but I was to discover it was another thing altogether. That was all the encouragement he needed, this windbag, this doomsayer, this howling boar with a pointed nose and coconut head, and the lecture it precipitated was to last through dessert, cocoa, and mate in front of the fire, and the first, second, and third strokes of the Nino's bedtime. <clears throat> And you know, talking about there, he's talking about the blind rabbits. Um, if they were to survive blind through countless generations, not very likely, I'm afraid, they might well develop a genetic protection of some sort, just as the sub Saharan Africans developed an increase of melatonin in their skin to combat the sun. But, of course, we have so radically altered these creatures' environments that it is too late for that. He paused over an enormous forkful of cheesecake. Don Bob, he said, looking me squarely in the eye over the clutter of the table. Those rabbits were blinded by the sun's radiation, though you refused to see it, and I could just stroll up to them and pluck them up by the ears, as many as you could count in a day, and they had no more defense than a stone. The challenge was mine to accept, and though I had heard rumors of blind salmon in the upper reaches of the rivers, and birds blinded, and game too, I was not about to let him have his way at my own table in my own house. Yes, I observed dryly, and I suppose you'll be prescribing smoked lenses for all the creatures of the pompous now. Am I right? He made no answer which surprised me. Had he finally been stumped, bested, caught in his web of intrigue and hyperbole? 
But no, I had been too sanguine. Calamities never end. They just go on spinning out disaster from their own imperturbable centers. Maybe not for the rabbits, he said finally, but certainly this creature here could do with a pair of sunglasses. I leaned out from my chair and looked down the length of the table to where Senora Whiskers, and that was his Labrador retriever, sat with her head in the madman's lap. What do you mean, I demanded. <clears throat> Paloma was watching Isabella too. Call her to you, he said. I called, and the dog, reluctant at first, came down the length of the table to her master. Yeah, I said. Do you see the way she walks, head down, sniffing her way? Haven't you noticed her butting into the furniture, scraping the door frames? Look into her eyes, Don Bob. She has gone. She is going blind. And then I'm going to skip forward because uh, this would take all of the, you know, I'm reading about a third of this story. The dog wasn't blind. Any fool could see that. Perhaps her eyes were a bit cloudy, but that was to be expected in a dog of her age. And what if she was losing her sight? What did that prove? I'd had any number of dogs go blind, deaf, lame, and senile over the years. That was the way of dogs, and of men too. It was sad, it was regrettable, but it was part of the grand design, and there was no sense in running around the barnyard crowing your head off about it. I decided in that moment to go away for a few days, to let the basketball and the novelty of Mr. John Longworth dissipate like the atmospheric gases of which he spoke so endlessly. So then he heads out into his ranch. He owns this giant sheep ranch with 9,000 sheep grazing on it. And he gets out there and he, and he finds all of his ranch hands uh, freaking out, uh, you know, that the sky is falling, uh, <laughs> and, 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 out, and, you know, they're all freaking out that they're all dying, and the, uh, and so he, he's dealing with all of this, just getting, um, you know, just getting deeper and deeper in, uh, in, into the gloom. Uh, <clears throat> this is one of his ranch hands, Slobodan. Don Bob, Slobodan said in his creaking, unoiled tones, I want to go back out on the range with the others, and I don't care how old and feeble you think I am. Anything is better than this. One more day with that devil from hell, and I swear I will slit my throat. It seemed that when John Longworth wasn't out taking measurements or inspecting the teeth, eyes, pelt, and tongue of every creature he could trap, coerce, or pin down, he was lecturing the ranch hands, the blacksmith, and the household help on the grisly fate, the ranch, the grisly fate that awaited them. They were doomed, he told them. All of mankind was doomed, and the drop of that doom was imminent, and if they valued the little time left to them, they would pack up and move north, anywhere away from the poisonous hole in the sky. And those spots on their hands, their throats between their shoulder blades, and caught fast in the cleavage of their breasts, those spots were cancerous, or at the very least, post-precancerous. They needed a doctor, a dermatologist, an oncologist. They needed to stay out of the sun. <coughs> they needed laser surgery, sunblock, dark glasses. The kitchen staff was threatening a strike, and Crispin Mansilla, who looked after the automobiles, had been so terrified of an open sore on his nose that he had taken his bicycle and set off on the road for Punta Arenas two days previous and no one 
had heard from him since. Yes, and so then on top of all this, uh, the ranch hands started spreading rumors that, uh, that John Longsworth uh, was making passes at, um, at his 18-year-old daughter, Paloma, and that is where he finally went berserk. Uh, and uh, so uh, he was, so he goes and grabs his gun to run uh, this doomer off his ranch. Uh, so then he tracks down, uh, he tracks down John Longsworth. Ungainly as a carrion bird, the coat ends tenting around him in the wind, he was bent over one of my hogs, peering into the cramped universe of its malicious little eyes, as if he could see all the evil of the world at work there. I confronted him with a shout, and he looked up from beneath the rim of his hat and the fastness of his wraparound sunglasses, but he didn't flinch, even as I closed the ground between us with the pistol held out before me like a homing device. I hate to be the bringer of bad news all the time, he called out, already lecturing me as I approached. But this pig is in need of veterinary care. It's not just the eyes, I'm afraid, but the skin too. You see here? <clears throat> I had stopped ten paces from him, the pistol trained on the nugget of his head. The pig looked up at me hopefully. Its companions grunted, rolled in the dust, united their backsides against the wind. Melanoma, he said sadly, shaking his visored head. Most of the other pigs have got it too. We are going for a ride, I told him. His jaw dropped beneath the screen of his glasses and I could see the intricate work of his front teeth. He tried for a smile. A ride? Your time is up here, senor, I said and the wind peeled back the sleeve of my jacket against the naked thrust of my gun. I am delivering you to Estancia Braun now, without your things, without even so much as a bag, and without any goodbyes either. You will have to live without your basketball hoop and sunblock for a few days. Now get to your feet. The plane is fueled and ready. He gathered himself up then and rose from the ground, the wind beating at his garments. <clears throat> It'll do no good to deny it, Don Bob, he said, talking over, talking over his shoulder as he moved off toward the shed where the super cub stood out of the wind. It's criminal to keep animals out in the open in conditions like these. It's irresponsible, mad. Think of your children, your wife. The land is no good anymore. It is dead, or it will be, and it is we who have killed it, the so-called civilized nations, with our air conditioners and underarm deodorant. It will be decades before the CFCs are eliminated from the atmosphere, if ever, and by then, there will be nothing left here but blind rabbits and birds that fly into the sides of rotting buildings. It's over, Don Bob. Your life here is finished. I did not believe a word of it. Naysaying and bitterness, that's all it was. I wanted to shoot him right then and there, on the spot, and be done with it. How could I, in good conscience, deliver him to Don Benedicto Braun, or to anyone, for that matter? He was the poison. He was the plague. He was the ecological disaster. We walked grimly into the wind, and he never stopped talking. Snatches of the litany came back to me. Ultraviolet, ozone, a hole in the sky bigger than the United States, but I only snarled out directions in the reply. <clears throat> and so anyway, uh, he stuffs him into the uh, airplane, 
and uh, guiltily the guy dumps him off to the next uh, poor schmuck and the next ranch over. And this is wrapping up the story. They say that courtesy is merely the veneer of civilization, the first thing sacrificed in a crisis, and I don't doubt the truth of that. I wonder what became of my manners on that punishing wind-torn afternoon. You would have thought I had been raised among the Indians, so eager was I to dump my unholy cargo and flee. Like Don Pablo, I did not linger, and I could read the surprise and disappointment and perhaps even hurt in Don Benedetto's face when I pressed his hand and climbed back into the plain. Weather, I shouted, and pointed to the sky where a wall of cloud was already sealing us in. I looked back as he receded on the ground beneath me, the inhuman form of Mr. John Longworth at his side, long arms gesticulating, the lecture already begun. It wasn't until I reached the verges of my own property, Estancia Castillo stretched out beneath me like a worn carpet and the dead black clouds moving in to strangle the sky, that I had my own moment of doubt. What if he was right, I thought? What if Manuel Bancodano truly was riddled with cancer? What if? My dog had been blinded by the light. What if my children were at risk? What then? The limitless turf unraveled beneath me and I reached up a hand to rub at my eyes. Weary suddenly, a man wearing the crown of defeat. A hellish vision came to me then, a vision of 9,000 sheep bleeding on the range, their fleece stained and blackened, and every one of them, every one of those inestimable and beloved animals, my inheritance, my life, imprisoned behind a glistening new pair of wraparound sunglasses. So powerful was the vision, I could almost hear them bang out their distress. My heart seized. Tears started up in my eyes. Why go on, I was thinking. What hope is there? But then the sun broke through the gloom in two pillars of fire. The visible world come to life with a suddenness that took away my breath. Color bursting out everywhere. The range green all the way to the horizon. Trees nodding in the wind the very rock faces of the Cerrado set aflame, and the vision was gone. I listened to the drone of the engine, tipped the wings toward home, and never gave it another thought. <laughs> Amen, brother. T.C. Boyle. Blinded by the Light from the Book of Short Stories, Tooth and Claw, and uh, now that I uh, understand uh, why Doomers, why we are the single uh, most despised human beings on the planet, well, next to anti-maskers, I guess, uh, I can get back uh, to terrifying study finds melting permafrost could unleash way more carbon than we thought. And I highly advise you to get out there and buy some wraparound sunglasses while you still can. Bye, guys.